that was that a good egg producing egg, well, chicken. Yeah. <laughs> it's my best laying hen. But apparently she didn't take to the Dittlers. She didn't take to those Dittlers. And then he didn't like that too much. No, he just, no. He he, he had very little patience and tolerance for, for most everything. Including people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he seemed like a man who was very set in his way. Very. And like his way, it was like his way or the highway Absolutely. kind of thing. And he didn't negotiate. No, I mean, no there was no, his idea of negotiating is like, either you do this or I'm going to bash your head against a pole. <laughs> kind of thing. His idea of nego- negotiation was, have a seat when he came to visit. Well, I'm letting you have the opportunity to stand or sit. That's <laughs> right. That's his idea of negotiating. But I... I mean, some have called him a, a mean man or et cetera, et cetera. I never saw that out of him. I mean, I right. loved him very much. You know, I found him fascinating. And, and uh, they really educated us. Like anything they were doing, they always talked through it in a way to where we could see the process. So everything was like a teachable moment. Everything, especially my grandmother, especially but um, one of the things I remember about Daddy Rich was um, he would always tell me he was going to give me quarters or change. He'd say, I got something for you. And I'd walk over and he would hand me a quarter, quote unquote, that had a hole in the middle. But it was like a nut, like a nut and bolt. Like uh-huh, one of those things, uh-huh. those uh, washers. A washer. Is that what it's yes, called, right? Yes, it goes on a screw. Or a washer. Uh-huh. <laughs> Guess if you're yes. from a certain place. But he would hand me a, a washer. And it would, you know, and he'd say, how'd that penny get a hole in it? Or how'd that quarter get a and hole in it? And you would go it? up there and say, can I have some money with a hole in it? Yeah. And like, you ch- you value the one with the hole in it more. Yeah, because it was like a joke, but I did. I got to where it was like I wanted it. <laughs> and he always wore overalls. Always. And he always had a red and occasionally a navy blue bandana in, in the front bib of his overalls. And I just, I can just close my eyes vividly, see him pulling that out and wiping sweat and sticking it back in there. Like mm-hmm. that was specifically to wipe the sweat. I always remember him in overalls. And then my other papa, my other great grandpa, I remember him wearing overalls, pointers all the time, mm-hmm. you know, yes. with a white cotton t-shirt. And he, but he would wear a pith helmet. Oh like yeah. That green pith helmet uh-huh. hat that he would wear. That looked like, you know, oh, I think he had it from the army, you know, from like World War II. It was like an army hat. And he would wear that out, like working in his garden or when he was riding his mower or something. He would always wear that, you know, because he was I remember bald. that and now. Yeah. Yes. So it's funny because I remember both of them. Like when I think of my great grandfathers, you know, because they were part of my mm-hmm. life, you know, for a while. They're both in overalls. I have them. Um... Well, I had, but I had to return them. But I'm hoping that my uncle will let me have them. He has a little pair of overalls, and I'm gonna—I'm uh, just gonna make a guess that maybe they're like a size 12 months. Okay, so little. 18 months, little bitty. But my grandmother would cut up my grandfather's overalls when they were old and ratty and stuff, and she would make her son's little overalls. How cute! But not even for babies, but on up until they were say like 10, she could get, she could make a pair. For, like, say, a 10-year-old out of his old ones. That, well, one but. thing I remember um, from Nana when I was a kid, and she would say this was something that they would do, is um, she would roll my hair on paper bags, brown paper bags. Uh-huh. She would take a brown paper bag and cut it up into these little strips that were maybe, um, like, an inch and a half wide and maybe five or six inches long. And she would, like, fold them in half and lay a strand of my hair in it and then somehow fold it up. And um, that's how she said they would curl their hair. And twist the two ends together. Yep. And that's and I would sleep on those, and wake up and my hair would look like Annie. Uh huh. I mean, just curls like and tight curls uh-huh. like to your head. And she said that's how they would roll their hair when they were girls and teenagers. You know, when that was the thing to have curly wow. hair. Yeah, so that's something that, you know, most people probably have never experienced. I never saw my grandmother make lye soap. I don't know why the hair thing, I guess, remind me of the lye soap. Because my mom was talking the other day about, we were talking about shampoo and all the hair products we use. And she mentioned the lye soap for shampoo. And I thought, man, I can't even believe anybody still had hair. But yeah, then I went no on kidding. to ask her, how exactly do you make lye soap? Because I, I hear about it and I see it at local Little gift shops and farmers occasionally, markets, and yeah, little like produce that. stands. But I, I don't think I ever saw my grandmother make that. 
but she said that she had a bucket beside the what they call the cook stove, which was mm-hmm. the wood cook stove, a bucket. And when she would trim any kind of meat, she would just chunk her fat, just toss it in that bucket. And that usually it would just sit there until it was full or until she decided, hey, I have a few minutes, I'm going to make some soap. And she would boil and boil and boil that. And I guess it turned into what, much like what cooking oil would be, I imagine. Yeah. And um, literally add lye, red devil lye, red devil lye. L Y E into that and um, boil it and boil it. And then I guess she poured it into some type of a pan and let it set up like what I think of them making fudge. Like I think of that. Yeah. And then, and then when it cooled, slice it. And that was their soap. And I just can't imagine. But you grew it's up animal fat. We were talking about like the groundhog thing. And I was saying how that really disturbed me. And I've never eaten groundhog, never tried it. Um, but that was like common, like Daddy mm-hmm. Rich ate groundhog, right? And, and the groundhog s- grease was a medicine. You, well, I've heard of that my yes. whole life. Oh yeah. Like if you had the croup, mm-hmm. you would croup drink. Would be respiratory, yeah. Yeah. Cold. Well, if you're cough. listening to Mountain Murders and you don't know what the croup is, then <laughs> you need to find a new podcast. No, I'm just kidding. We could do a medical episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the medical remedies that I've always been given was just take a shot of this, and it would be. <laughs> Some liquor. Hotty toddy. The moonshine. Well, my papa Carol would constantly, if I would be sick, he would be like, just go in there and get you a shot of that. Oh, would, really? Yeah. I don't think I ever knew Papa Carol did that. Well, he would give me beer when I was like two, well, so what do you expect? Now now, now it's coming out. But yeah, he would say, I, I got a jar in there, that homemade wow. in the freezer, and you just huh. need to drink you a little bit of that. And he'd basically give me a shot, and it would help. But the groundhog grease, you would drink that. Well, I hadn't seen it. Doesn't that make in you years. sick as a dog? Though? And I hadn't like, even ew. heard of groundhog grease in years, you know. But I'm guessing about two years ago, my uncle gave me a couple of little bottles of groundhog grease and said, "Take this, you know, in case somebody was yeah, sick." Yeah, absolutely. And then he gave me like a couple of baby food jars, and it looked like lard. And he said, "That's bear grease, and you can use that to make biscuits." And I took it, but I don't. I mean, I. No, nothing. Um, I'm not being condescending in any way. You know that. Yeah. But I don't. I don't cook that way. You know. I don't. I don't think I would ever use bear grease to make cook biscuits. I'm sorry. I just that's just not something I would do. Well, he'll give them to me. I would love to. But make you know. But biscuits. I was polite and I accepted oh, well, yeah, it. Of so I'm. I'm assuming that he still does that. But he still does live much, much, much like that. Yeah, he I mean, does. he is very, very, very self-sufficient. We were talking about canning recently, mm-hmm. and he was saying all the things, you know, telling me all the things he had canned recently, mm-hmm. and you know that kind of thing. So yeah, but yeah, I just think it's so interesting. So growing up, groundhog, that was something that was, mm-hmm. and how would you would just fry that? The groundhog, yeah. Let's see. I don't know how everybody else prepared it, but my grandmother would boil it. Okay, and then she would. Uh, what they call par parboil, parboil. Yeah, parboil. I always thought they said were saying parboil, but it was parboil or yeah, something. Yeah, par- parboil. And they would yeah, boil that, that groundhog, and then she would um, put it in a big cast iron pan. Okay. And put um, some kind of pepper, because you know they always grew lots and lots of different kinds of peppers. Yeah. Something like about a medium strength as far as heat, and she would put this pepper on it, little pepper flakes, and put it in that. Wood cook stove. Now, would you like debone the groundhog? No, at this stage, it was it just still like had, a hole. It was in, the little critter. Enact in, in yeah. disemboweled. No hands, no feet. <laughs> no hands and feet. No paws. Well, this is a murder podcast. No so heads. Yeah. Okay. So, and then bake it. So there's the critter. Uh huh. Power boil it, and then they'd put it in the cast iron pan, and With she'd put pepper. it in that wood cook stove in the oven, mm-hmm. and brown it like really, really brown it, and you could hear it kind of sizzling. And then whenever, I guess it was ready or whatever, she would take it out. And, um, wow. So, and what, it was a bit, I mean, that was common what is thing. It ta- what was it, the taste? In my household, in my household with my mom and my siblings, we did not eat groundhog. Okay. But I, but we stayed at my grandparents more, more, we stayed there more than we did at my house because we were always up there working and helping them. Yeah. And I, 
regretful. I am regretful to admit that I did eat it. But, you know, I was a kid. It was putting on the table and well, we didn't why? question There's it. Well, why? There's still people who eat grog. Well, we didn't question it either. I mean, in my family, you didn't question it. You just ate it. Yeah. Um, you was know, it I, gamey? I, was it like... I remember it being delicious. I can remember walking in and hearing that sizzling and smelling that and thinking, ooh, goody. Oh, no, that was my favorite thing. Favorite thing. What about squirrel? I don't really remember eating squirrel much, but I do remember eating like squirrel gravy, which was almost like chicken and dumplings. That's what it reminded me of. But um, but I, I don't remember eating it regularly, but I feel like I did eat it. But they did. But oh, Granny yes. loved squirrel brains, Yes, right? she did, and I never knew that until she was sick and dying. Because didn't you tell me a story about she... Well, she mm-hmm. had a brain tumor. She, she came, did? Yeah. Uh-huh. And... So she, she was pretty sick for about two years. And she really wanted someone to bring mm-hmm. her squirrel brains? And one of my uncles had gone squirrel hunting, you know, specifically for her. And they come carrying in this, um, you know, container with snap-on lid. And my aunt, who's just the really good, good, good woman. And she's a country woman, but she... Uh, Pop the top right off that container and started taking these little little things, and I'm going to just refer to them as dumplings because I didn't know what it was. Right, okay. And she would just put them to my grandmother's mouth and just take her thumb and just pop it. Okay. And then put it in my grandma's mouth, and she would kind of suck it, sort of like much like you might a a juicy pear or something. Okay. And um. And I mean, this happened a couple of times, and then I could see my aunt had something in her hand that was waste. But now my grandmother's really sick is the well, reason yeah. she didn't do all this for herself. But, um, you know, my grand- the, my aunt had something that looked like waste, and she'd kind of toss that. And that, still, I don't really know what's going on. And But, you know, after a while, somebody said something about that was squirrel heads, and she was sucking the brains out. And, but they're cooked, right? Oh, they're cooked, yes. Okay. But I, I even though I'd grown up, you know, there every day and seen everything I knew of that was country or mountain. I I don't know that I'd ever seen her eat that. Yeah. But did you ever have bear meat? Yes. I think it's greasy. I never liked it. I never liked it. I only it. had it a Mm-mm. couple of times, no. but I always thought it was like super, super greasy. Meat. No, I didn't like that. And, str- I didn't. and like stringy yes. or something? Yes. Yeah. Like, um, almost like the texture of a bad beef roast. Like yeah. Like a really bad beef roast. That's real tough and stringy. It was almost that texture, but much tougher, much stringier, and very strong. Well, yeah, really gamey. Yes. And ugh, gr- gr- real no, greasy I, uh, and just, yeah. Like chewy. I just, I did not like it. Well, now, the thing from my childhood that I still dearly love is pork. But, you know, I I acquire pork a little differently now. Now I go to the supermarket. But then, um, you know, they grew their own harvested their own meat and their own pork yeah so um, and there was like hog killing time mm -hmm. a year but my grandmother's hogs were different in that she did have them in a pen but it had a a roof on it and walls i mean it was more like a little cottage it reminded me of a cottage okay and that's where they were and that was the pig pen and we kids would peek in and peek in because i always thought it looks like a little playhouse but she would say, get away from there. And later, I guess I was a young adult when I asked my mom, you know, I thought about that. Why did she keep them kind of hidden? Like most pigs are in a pig pen you can go over because um, she didn't want to to have to look at them every day or associate them with being a pet or... Uh, it right, was a, no a kind way of, of emotional detaching. attachment yes. to them. It was a way for her to detach. But yeah, on hog killing day or whatever, it was a big community event. But I think because my grandmother and grandfather had six kids and then their spouses and then lots of the grandkids. Mm -hmm. And there would be a few, maybe just a few friends or something. So it wasn't that the community really helped. So it was mainly family, but the family was big. Plus the family all kind of lived in the same area, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because like Daddy Rich's brother lived right behind him. Yes. And there's... And we lived, um, what, a mile around yeah, trip? Yeah, lots and, of cousins um, mm-hmm. and stuff around. Exactly. and uh, But, yeah, they would, um, you know, just open the door and they'd run out and they would shoot them. But they really wanted it to be humane. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they took no pleasure 
it, you know, it wasn't something that they saw as, you know, oh, I got that one or, you know, right. good shot. or No, there was no talk. It happened, and the minute it happened, it was...